Hello everybody, um, thanks for coming out in such good numbers today. Um, as Janet mentioned, I've been teaching history here in Kent for nearly 15 years now. Now I'm here today to do a talk on Castle on the Downs, which is very convenient because I work in one of the castles on the Downs, Warmer Castle. Now of course, the castles were built um, in 1539, um, to deal with the serious threat of invasion from the Spanish and the French. Okay, they were Henry VIII's castles. But really, when we talk about the castles on the Downs, this story begins many, many years before 1539. Okay, and it really starts with the formation of the English Channel. Now, nobody really knows for sure when the English Channel formed. There are several different theories. One theory is that there was a flood which swept down and connected the North Sea up here to the Atlantic for the first time. And this happened around 150,000 years ago. There are other theories that the English Channel formed when a landslide in Scandinavia landed in the North Sea and it sent a tsunami wave all the way down, which again, rushed over low-lying land and connected the North Sea to the Atlantic for the first time. Now, what the English Channel created, ultimately, was a very, very deadly legacy, um, the Goodwin Sands. Now, the Goodwin Sands absolutely fascinate me. Um, they're known as the uh, widow maker or the ship swallower. Over the years, they've claimed the lives of thousands and thousands and thousands of sailors and hundreds and hundreds of ships too. Um, in one storm alone in 1703, over 40 ships were pushed um, from where they were sat at anchor onto the Goodwin Sands and that night alone thousands of sailors um, perished. Um, Daniel Defoe, he wrote a fictionalised account of the Great Storm in 1703. Now, in actual fact, people from the town of Deal, they rode out to the Goodwin Sands and they saved hundreds and hundreds of people. Okay? They were very, very brave people. That isn't the story, though, that Daniel Defoe decided to tell. He told a story where local people from Deal rode out and instead of helping the people stranded on the Goodwin Sands, instead they raided all of the ships and this was reported in the press across the whole country and it gave the town of Deal a really, really bad reputation. Now, as a little boy, I visited the Goodwin Sands. <laughs> um, I was obsessed with treasure. Um, they say there's around £150 million pounds worth of gold and silver um, buried out there on the sand. Um, sadly, I didn't find any of that treasure that day. Um, hence, I'm here telling you all about the castles on the downs and I'm not sat on a yacht somewhere in the Mediterranean surrounded by models. <laughs> um, now, the origin of the uh, Goodwin Sands um, really interests me. Um, we don't really know where the Goodwin Sands came from. Um, in some accounts, people talk of them originally being islands. Um, that were washed away, and now we just have the uh, sandbanks. Um, I read a book once, and it talked about a pub in Ramsgate, and this was in the late 18th century. They had a chess board, okay, and they used to play chess on this board, and apparently the chess set was made from the last tree that grew on the, the island that was the Goodwin Sands, and they claimed the island was called Lemia. Now, there's no actual evidence, not that I've found, um, that they were actual islands. Um, some geologists have gone out to the sands and they've um, sort of dug into the sand and they've found um, sort of decay, which proves that at one stage there was plant life growing on the Goodwin Sands. But again, this is very, very sceptical. Now, the reason I'm talking about the Goodwin Sands because ultimately... If the Goodwin Sands didn't exist, um, the castles on our coast wouldn't exist. Um, the castles on our coast were built because of the Downs anchorage. <clears throat> now, as dangerous as they are on their own, the Goodwin Sands, they create 
a section of sheltered water in between the dams and the coastline. Now that sheltered water is so large it can accommodate up to 1,500 warships. Okay, now you have to remember that Caesar landed his forces on our beach. By 1539, Henry VIII was very aware that if an invasion force landed on our beach, they would march all the way to Canterbury within a day. Okay, and then they'd occupy the city of Canterbury. Now, by 1539, Canterbury was a walled city. So if they'd successfully landed on our beach here at Deal or Warmer, okay, this country would have faced a really serious problem trying to repel those forces. Now, <clears throat> there are many, many different reasons why the castles were built. Um, it's partly to do with geography, to do with the fact that we are clo so close to the French coast, and it's partly to do with the Goodwin Sands and the Downs anchorage. It's also to do with a power struggle um, between the three most powerful men in the whole of Europe at the time. In the red corner, we have the red-headed tyrant himself, um, <laughs> our once king, Henry VIII. <laughs> now, Henry VIII was incredibly ambitious, okay? He followed in his father's footsteps um, in that way, and particularly in uh, military terms. Um, he wanted to become the most powerful man in the whole of Europe. Um, we all think of Henry VIII as being um, sort of a ruthless tyrant, okay? I think that's partly because at school we all learn um, that basically he beheaded his wives, and as a result we think of him being a savage. But in actual fact, Henry VIII was incredibly well-educated. Now, this gentleman here is Charles V, the King of Spain and the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Okay, now, he was very good friends at one stage with Henry VIII. The third person in this power struggle is this gentleman here. I quite like this image. It's quite comical, isn't it? <laughs> um, this is Francis I of France. Okay, um, for a long time he'd been enemies um, with Henry VIII. Uh, he was also enemies <coughs> with the Spanish. So this man, for a long time, posed absolutely no threat to Henry VIII whatsoever. Now, ultimately, the castles on our coastline exist because of the most tragic relationship in British history. Okay? And it's this, these two here. Now, the gentleman on the left-hand side is Arthur. He was born heir to the English throne. This is Henry VIII's older brother. Now, when he was four years old, his parents arranged a marriage with Catherine of Aragon. Okay? She was a year older than him. She was five years old. Of course, their parents had to wait a long, long time for them to come of age. But this relationship um, sealed the French, sorry, the Spanish and the English, the two sort of powerhouses of Europe. Now, if you ever think about alternative histories, um, this tragic relationship's a great one. Now, unfortunately, when they finally married, okay, she was 16 years old, um, he was 15 years old, um, they married in St Paul's Cathedral, okay? Anyone guess? Um, who walked her up the aisle? It's quite comical. Um, little Henry, Prince Henry, was about seven or eight years old. <laughs> Who would have known the sort of future they had in store? Now, sadly, after only four months of marriage, um, they both fell ill. Um, she recovered, but within two weeks, Prince Arthur here died. Now, some people say that he died of plague. Um, it's more likely that he died of tuberculosis. Okay, but as soon as he had died, their parents panicked because suddenly this fantastic relationship which was going to bring these two powerful countries together um, was in jeopardy. So it was decided that they would annul the marriage, but they couldn't do this initially 
because many people believed she was actually pregnant. So they, because they'd been married for four months, it was quite likely. So they had to wait um, about a month, six weeks, to make sure she wasn't pregnant before they annulled the marriage. Okay? And then from that point on, they planned to marry her to Henry VIII, who had suddenly become heir to the throne of England. Now, what is quite comical about this story is that this man, he wasn't raised to become King of England. He was raised to become Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> and when you take that into consideration, what we know now about Henry VIII and his church, it's quite, it's quite comical, isn't it? Now, Henry VIII, as King of England, um, he wanted to make a stand and become the most powerful man in the whole of Europe. Okay? So very cleverly, um, he joined forces with Charles V, the King of Spain. Okay? And he turned on the French. And for a number of years, Spain and England, together, side by side, attacked the French. Okay? Um, removed a lot of power away from Francis I. And then... In 1523, this man suddenly realised something. Um, he wasn't the most powerful man in Europe. Charles V was. Okay? And this concerned him so much that he switched sides. <laughs> and he joined forces with Francis I against Charles V. Okay? Which was um, a disastrous move, really, because... Charles V um, was his wife, Catherine of Aragon's nephew, okay? So in family terms, it wasn't great. But also in religious terms, it wasn't great either because Charles V had a lot of sway with the church because he was emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, okay? So it was quite a dangerous tactic. Now, for many, many years, this man had, had nothing to worry about. As long as he could keep... Um, the French and the Spanish apart, militarily, he was the strongest. The problem is, is in 1538, the French and the Spanish finally signed a treaty together and joined forces. Okay, and then suddenly he panicked. He realised that an invasion um, was imminent. Uh, by 1538, he'd completely angered the church um, by printing Bibles in English and by creating the Church of England and evicting the Catholics from this country. So the Pope promised to bless any king that would reintroduce the Catholic faith to this country. So early in 1539, Henry VIII sent his engineers down to the south coast of England to study the south coast for weaknesses. Okay? Now, you'll see the three castles that are on our coastline in Kent here. And that's because immediately they saw the threat that the Downs anchorage posed. Because, of course, all they had to do is cross over from France here, and suddenly they'd be anchored in the Downs. And without castles there to repel them, their forces would land on the beach and this country would fall. So Henry VIII, he built castles all the way along the south coast of England paying particular attention to this stretch here, which is one of the most dangerous stretches, um, most vulnerable parts of our coastline. <laughs> um, and here in this image, you can um, <clears throat> see the kind of down anchorage a little bit more clearly. Now, of course, this isn't a small stretch of coastline. Um, really, he needed to build a fort that was two and a half miles long. Okay? In engineering terms, um, that was a huge, huge challenge. One castle alone wouldn't quite do it. So, Henry VIII, um, he employed an engineer, um, a man named Stefan von Haschenberg. Okay? Stefan von Haschenberg. He had studied um, engineering um, from a man called Albrecht Dürer, okay? Albrecht Dürer, in the 1530s, he published a book 
Um, and in this book, he explained that circular bastion walls um, were a much more advanced design than square walls because they deflected cannon fire. Um, this was a breakthrough in castle design. Um, castles had never been built like this in this country. Some had in Italy, but never here in this country. Now, Stefan von Haschenberg, he came and stayed in the town of Deal, and he oversaw um, the castles being built here. Now, if you haven't seen this image before, it may surprise you, because as, long, as well as having three masonry castles, one at Sandown in the distance, um, one at Deal over there, um, and we have Warmer Castle here. Um, there were also four bulwarks, okay? Um, these were made um, using mud, um, some stone, and of course would have had cannons there as well. And there were ditches and ramparts linking this entire fort up. So in actual fact, it was two and a half miles long. Quite an incredible feat of engineering, isn't it? Now, initially, um, Henry VIII, he employed uh, 1,400 men. Um, of course, he had a standing army, so he didn't need to recruit um, <laughs> that well. Um, their initial task was to build the bulwarks, okay, and do all of the groundwork in preparation for the masonry castles being built. Um, in the background here, you can <laughs> see... Uh, wooden scaffolding around Sandown Castle. They've just begun building Sandown Castle there. Now, if you've ever stood near the Royal Hotel in Deal, as you walk along the promenade, if you look down the side streets towards Middle Street, you can see it always goes down. Now, that largely owes itself to 1539, because, of course, to build this up, they had to bring lots and lots of mud from just down that way. And that's why the seafront in Deal, okay, sits higher than Middle Street. Now, they began work on the 1st of April in 1539, and it was completed um, in 1540. Deal Castle, um, completely unique design, um, it had three layers of bastions. Now, the, you see in the middle, there's a sort of circular turret, and then there's a layer of six bastions, and then another layer of six bastions. There were four different levels for gun emplacements, okay? So effectively, you had cannons firing in every single direction. The castles were built with dry moats. Um, which was always a very uh, dangerous move, building a castle so close to the coastline with a dry moat, okay? Um, and it paid the price ultimately, I'll tell you about that um, shortly. But effectively, anybody that got into that moat um, wasn't getting out of that moat alive, because it was effectively just a kill zone. Um, as well as having cannons in the moat, there are small windows people would stand in there. Initially in 1539 they would have been armed with bows and arrows and crossbows. Um, but as the years wore on, um, we moved into firepower. It's the grandest castle Henry VIII ever built. You'll see here, this is an aerial view of Warmer Castle as it is today. Now, Sandown Castle and Warmer Castle, that Sandwich Deal Castle. Um, they were a different design. Uh, they were a much simpler design. So you still have the circular turret, but they just have one level of bastions, and there are four of them instead of six. But they still had four different levels for cannons, and they could still fire in every single direction. Now, not a lot of what you can see there is actually original. Um, over the years, so many different architectural changes have um, taken place at Warmer Castle as new Lord Wardens have gone in. It's quite difficult to work out what is original and what isn't nowadays. Mm. Now, 
If you visited the castles, you may have noticed this before. Um, this is a technique called garroting. Um, the castles, um, they were built out of stone that was brought over from Canterbury for when St Augustine's Abbey was pulled down. Now, of course, um, Henry VIII, um, he married um, Catherine of Aragon at a very young age. Um, if you just take a moment and try and put yourself in Henry VIII's shoes, um, marrying the widow of your dead wife, or sorry, your dead brother, it must have been very, very difficult for him. Um, his marriage to Catherine of Aragon was the longest marriage he was ever in. Um, but of course, sadly, Catherine of Aragon didn't give him the son he needed. Um, in actual fact, she gave birth to a number of sons. But sadly, in those days, very few children actually survived. Um, they say roughly one in 200 children survived to see their 21st birthday in those days. So Henry VIII, um, he had lots of male children, they just all died, so he, he never actually had an heir. What is very interesting about Henry VIII is he did a actually have um, at least one illegitimate son, okay? Um, he made him a duke, but of course, because he was illegitimate, um, he wasn't heir to the throne of England, but he was Henry VIII's blood son. Now, eventually, um, Henry VIII started to get very tired and he, he obviously wanted an heir. Um, being king of England, you kind of get a bit of a choice of women <laughs> as such. So Henry VIII, um, he started... Um, uh, ooh, Think of a, a good way of putting it. <laughs> Mucking around with um, <laughs> a maid um, called Anne Boleyn. What's quite interesting as well, he was also mucking around with Anne Boleyn's older sister, Mary Boleyn. Um, Henry VIII was probably mucking around with a lot of different women at the time. One of the problems is, is that Anne Boleyn um, was quite firm with him. Um, and she explained to him she wasn't just happy with him mucking around with her. Um, in actual fact, she wanted um, him to divorce and marry her, and she was quite firm about this. So eventually, Henry VIII decided that he would give her what he wanted. Um, the problem is with all of this um, is that he needed the Pope on his side to grant that divorce. And of course, in the Pope's ear was Charles V, um, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, who was saying adamantly, Henry VIII is one of my enemies, um, she's my auntie, why would I grant you know, this divorce? So for many, many years this went on. Henry VIII, for about seven years, tried to get a legitimate divorce um, from Catherine of Aragon, but it wasn't going to happen. So being as ruthless as he was, he created the Church of England, um, he evicted the Catholic Church from this country, and of course created huge, huge problems. Going back to um, Gallatin. <laughs> um, this stone was brought over from Canterbury when St Augustine's Abbey was destroyed as part of the reformation of the church when Henry VIII created the Church of England. So Henry VIII, soldiers, um, and engineers had an absolute abundance of building materials. Now, St. Augustine's Abbey was built with stone that was brought over from Caen in Normandy in 1180 by Henry II. Um, Henry II was a descendant of William the Conqueror. The French, um, they used this type of stone. Um, it's called cornstone um, because it's very advanced. When you took it out of the ground, it was very soft and it was very easy to shape. Um, but as time wore on, it reacted with the air and it solidified and became very, very advanced. And Henry II, he preferred this stone. Canterbury Cathedral was built with this stone. <clears throat> Most of Canterbury, the ground was built with this stone. So Henry VIII had a huge abundance of this stone. Now, it's quite romantic in a sense to think the stone was brought over from France to this country. We built cathedrals with it and abbeys with it. Um, then Henry VIII um, had a problem with the church. He destroyed these abbeys. He brought the stone, that French stone, 
over to the coastline and he used that French stone to defend the coast against the French. <laughs> Goes in a bit of a full circle, doesn't it? Now, the mortar that was used on the castles um, was lime mortar. Now, lime mortar um, is very, very soft, and there were fears that the lime mortar would react with the salt in the sea air, okay, and it would crumble very easily. So they decided to use this technique called gallatin. Now, because this whole area of Kent, the ground is made out of chalk, Chalk is found alongside um, flint, so we had an abundance of flint as well. So they decided to use flint in the mortar here, partly to weatherproof it, um, and it was believed for a long time that it was used to make the walls impossible to climb, because of course flint is very, very sharp. Um, uh, English Heritage head of historian has since sort of disproved that arguing that soldiers in armour would have never been able to physically climb any of the walls that wouldn't have been in their battle plan anyway so that was just speculation one thing we do know though is that when you fire a cannon at this wall um, because it's round it will deflect the cannonball um, but also the flint will shatter and it will send shards of flint everywhere a bit like shrapnel, so from a defensive point of view, it is very, very beneficial as well. It also makes the castles look very pretty. <laughs> so, of course, um, the castles were built to protect the downs anchorage. Okay, um, the reason they're so close together is very cleverly calculated. If anybody's visited Warmer Castle recently, you'll see the cannons up on the bastions, and they're 32 pound cannonballs. Um, they can only fire about 500 yards. The original cannons at the castles, um, they fired 64 pound cannonballs that were like footballs, and they could fire the cannons um, about 2,000 yards into the downs. The cannons were so powerful um, that the castles could cross fire. Okay, so any ship that's entering the downs, um, if it was an enemy ship, would seriously face a problem when the castles all simultaneously started firing on them. Um, of course, the downs was always full up in later years with merchant ships. And if um, you were entering the downs, you had to um, either fire a cannon out to sea, you can see the, the the ship in front of Deal Castle doing just that, or you had to lower your flag to half mast to signal the castles that you're a friend of the country, otherwise they'd start firing on you. Now, this image here, um, this is Sandown Castle. Okay, um, I grew up from the, in the north end of Deal, um, and there's nothing really left of Sandown Castle um, nowadays. If anyone's been down there though, um, Linda Ford um, and all the volunteers have done an absolutely exceptional job um, with the gardens. I really recommend you going down there and taking a look at it. It's absolutely beautiful. But nothing that's down there now is original, I'm afraid. This is actually the closest image you'll ever get to what Warmer Castle would have originally looked like. Okay? You can see the round turret in the middle is the highest point of the castle. Okay, if you visit Warmer Castle now, you'll notice that it isn't anymore. Okay, nowadays, um, there's a building above the gatehouse, okay, which isn't original. Now, in 1785, um, C entered the dry moat at Sandown Castle for the first time. And this was largely because when the port was built in Ramsgate, it affected the way the tide was flowing around the Kent coast. Now, it didn't take long at all for the sea water to seriously start destabilising um, the castle itself. Um, by about 1850, um, the sea had come up so close that waves were crashing against the bastion walls and going over the whole of the castle. Um, it had become really, really dangerous. Now, they were built in 1539, uh, the invasion threat of 1539 passed so quickly, it virtually disappeared by the time they were finished. Um, the castles become redundant very, very quickly. Okay? Um, Sandown Castle itself, um, it was 
still garrisoned um, during the Napoleonic Wars. Um, but in 1648, during the English Civil War, um, the castles lay at siege. Um, by then, grenades had been invented and people were just throwing grenades over the bastion walls and they were exploding inside the castle. And the people inside the castle um, simply had to surrender. Um, technology moves so, so quickly. I um, went to Peru, and in Peru, I was going to a lot of the battlefields, and when the Spanish arrived there, they would have battles where there'd be a, one Spanish person in armour against sort of 100, 200 native people, and they had wooden shields and wooden swords. So, of course, the Spanish just rode through them, cutting them down. Um, technology moves, moves so quickly, doesn't it? Now, in the 1860s, Warm, uh, Sandown Castle um, was destroyed, okay? Um, they used explosives to destroy um, the upper parts of it to reduce it all to one level so it no longer posed a threat. Some of that stone was taken into deal and it was used to build this pier here. Yeah, that's um, one of Dill's many piers. Over the years, Dill's had four different piers. Anybody know what happened to this pier? <laughs> yeah, the ship Nora, um, during the uh, Second World War, um, it was tied up on the beach um, near the Port Arms. So it wasn't a great distance from the pier but it become unstuck and it drifted out and it drifted straight into the pier. Yeah, completely destroyed it. Um, the pier we have at the moment in Deal was built in the 1950s. Yeah. Now, also, large parts of Sandown Castle were taken to warm up to build the section above the gatehouse. Now, walking around Warmer, I often find it very difficult to tell what is original and what isn't original. Okay? It's because all of the building work was done to a, such a high standard um, with the exact building materials, it's impossible to tell. If you look at this image, and then you look at that image, you can see the gatehouse on the left-hand side is only on one level. And you can really see the difference there. Now, the section above the gatehouse um, was built to accommodate the Lord Warden of the Sink Ports. It's an 11 bedroom private apartment. Now, when we talk about the castles on the coastline, it's impossible not to talk about the Sink Ports because. Of course, Warmer Castle nowadays is the official residence of the Lord Warden of the Sink Ports. The big question is, what are the Sink Ports? Well, they were established in the 12th, 12th century. Um, they were established by Royal Charter in 1155 by King Henry II. Um, he only became king in 1154, so it was one of his kind of top priorities. It's basically because in the 12th century, this country didn't have a navy. Um, the navy, the Royal Navy, um, was a Tudor invention. It was one of um, Henry VIII's ideas. But of course, for centuries and centuries and centuries, we've had ships in this country. So in 1155, Henry II did a deal and established the Sink Ports. Um, sink, in French, in the 12th century, meant... Five. Okay. Nowadays, in modern French, it's pronounced sank. Okay. But when we talk about the sink ports, the proper pronunciation should be sink, because in the 12th century, when it was founded, um, the word for five in French was sink. Now, they originally were Sandwich, Dover, Hyde, Romney, and Hastings. Um, their job was to provide ships and to provide provisions in times of war. For example, um, Hastings, the sink port of Hastings, provided 20 ships um, for the Spanish Armada in 1588. Um, there are a few different dates where the castles on the Downs would have been fully garrisoned. Um, 1588 was one of those times. Um, they say that in Deal, um, there were so many battles going on in the English Channel that 
when, when the Spanish Armada passed through the English Channel, um, the whole of the horizon was lighting up in gunfire. Thankfully, though, the Spanish Armada met a storm um, and got dragged up the North Sea and around Scotland. Um, if that hadn't been the case, if that <coughs> storm hadn't existed, um, I could be standing here delivering this talk in Spanish. Um, but we'd probably have a fairly good football team on the, uh, on, the, on the other side. So, you know, every cloud has a silver lining. Thankfully, though, the Spanish Armada didn't pull into the Downs anchorage. Um, now, in 1708, uh, the Duke of Dorset, a man named Lionel Sackville, this isn't Lionel Sackville, by the way. <laughs> Um, in 1708, Lionel Sackville, he decided to take Warmer Castle, which was just a plain fort, as his home, because he decided that Dover Castle, which was his residence as Lord Warden of the Sink Ports, was a bit too large. So that was when the very slow change from Warmer Castle, that was a plain masonry castle, began turning it into the sort of luxurious house it is today. Okay. Um, over the years, we've had many, many famous Lord Wardens of the Sink Port. So I'm going to tell you about a few of them. Um, this gentleman here, um, William Pitt the Younger. Out of all the Lord Wardens, in many ways, he interests me the most because I'm often standing here talking about smuggling. Now, this man is the youngest Prime Minister this country's ever had. He took office at the age of 24. Not only was he Prime Minister, he was also Chancellor of the Exchequer, and he held both roles um, for nearly 20 years. Now, when he took office, um, people laughed. They said that nations would stand and stare at the country left to a schoolboy's care. Um, they really, really underestimated how much of a genius he was. Um, he was studying at Cambridge when he was 14 years old. Um, when it came to maths, he was absolutely phenomenal. He was the first person to introduce paper money to this country. Because when he took office, um, this country was near bankruptcy from fighting so many wars overseas, particularly against the French. Um, his job as Chancellor of the Exchequer was to balance the country's books. So he took gold off of everybody and he gave them paper in return. Which is absolute genius, isn't it, really? <laughs> um, he also introduced a number of taxes to balance the country's books. Um, he reintroduced the window tax to this country. Okay? Um, it was based on the idea that the richer you were, the bigger house you would have owned, and the more windows you would have had. Um, Seems quite logical, doesn't it? Of course, people have never liked paying taxes, so instead, people filled in their windows, and it's believed to be the origin of the expression daylight robbery. Yeah. Of course, uh, lots of people um, couldn't afford to pay the tax, but they didn't want to admit they were poor, so they filled in their windows, and they painted fake windows on the outside. <laughs> okay, And you still see that in some houses to this day. It's also to give that, look, um, that house a symmetrical look. On the flip side, very rich people used the window tax as a way of showing off how wealthy they were. So rich people were installing windows all over their houses, often in sort of low weight-bearing walls, and there were lots of buildings collapsing as a result of that. He also introduced um, another tax that most of you are probably familiar with. Um, he promised the country it would only last for 10 years, and he named it income tax. <laughs> um, now, that was over 200 years ago. Now, in this man's defence, it was only uh, 1%, so it was a penny in every pound. It's gone up slightly since, hasn't it? Um, the reason why he's so important to me is because I'm a bit obsessed with smuggling. Um, this man sent an army into the town of Deal on two different occasions. Firstly, in 1781. Um, because smuggling <coughs> presented such a, a big problem um, in terms of loss of revenue, um, it was really seriously affecting the economy. Um, and Deal, our lovely little hometown here, 
um, was ultimately the worst place in the entire country for smuggling. There were huge, huge gangs um, ferrying contraband across the channel daily. Um, this man was obsessed with Napoleon across the channel in France and the threat Napoleon um, caused him. Um, Napoleon, in fact, at one stage, opened up French ports to um, English smugglers because Napoleon um, was aware of the damage smuggling was doing to our economy in this country. So this man decided to stamp out smuggling. So he sent an army into deal in 1781. He promised Parliament they would retrieve £100,000 worth of contraband. Um, a fight ensued in the town. Um, a local man threw a mattock at one of the soldiers. Um, one of Pitt's soldiers shot him. He managed to survive, but lots of the soldiers, they threw lots of stones through windows of houses and shops. Um, he left the town of Deal in 1781 uh, with about £10,000 worth of contraband, which was still a huge, huge amount of contraband, but it wasn't what he promised Parliament. And he was fairly red-faced and embarrassed about it. He promised to return. A few years later, in 1784, he returned with a 1,000 soldiers, um, but this time he decided to use a completely different tactic. Instead of uh, trying to seize the contraband, his soldiers marched along the beach. Now, because of a heavy storm, all of the boats had been pulled really high up on the beach, and his soldiers just poured oil over all of them and lit them in front of the entire town. Now, in deal in those days, if you were not a smuggler, and to be honest with you, most people probably were, you were a fisherman. Um, so in one foul swoop, he destroyed the town's livelihood. Now, of course, smugglers earned immense fortunes, um, so they quickly rebuilt their smuggling fleets. It was the poor fishermen who suffered. A few years later, he was awarded the position of uh, Lord Warbland Sink Ports, and this man, he moved into Warmer Castle permanently, just a few miles away from the town where everybody hated him. <laughs> um, he did everything at a young age. He even died at a young age. He was only 46. But he's an absolutely fascinating historical character. This man here, the most famous of all the Lord Wardens of the Sink Ports, um, the Duke of Wellington. Um, the Duke of Wellington actually <coughs> lived in Warmer. Um, he left from Deal to go and fight the Peninsula Wars in 1808. Um, he became Lord Warden in 1829. Um, without a doubt, the most famous Lord Warden we've ever had. People say the Duke of Wellington um, was the second most famous person of the Victorian times, second only to his friend, Queen Victoria, um, who actually named one of her children after him. Of course, he sadly passed away at Warmer Castle. Yeah. Now, the Duke of Wellington isn't the only person to have died at Warmer Castle. Um, this gentleman here, um, W.H. Smith. Now, W.H. Smith, um, even though there are over 20 different Lord Wardens of the Sink Ports over the years, um, he's one that I hold in the highest regard. Um, he held the position for the shortest period of time. Now, in the 19th century, it was very popular for ex-prime ministers to become Lord Wardens. Um, the Duke of Wellington was even prime minister at one stage. Now, the Right Honourable W.H. Smith, he came in as Lord Warden, and in those days, he paid a very small sum of money to purchase all of the property at Warmer Castle. So he came in for, for a very small sum of money suddenly he owned lots and lots of items that belonged to the Duke of Wellington. Now, the Duke of Wellington in those days was an absolute megastar. Um, anything um, connected to the Duke of Wellington was worth a fortune. Now, to this man's credit, he, uh, he realised he could sell off all this stuff and make a fortune. But to him, history was very important. Um, and he pushed and pushed an act through Parliament called the Heirlooms Act. Um, and he, he died, sadly, before um, it was ever signed off. But after his death, it was signed off in Parliament. And it meant that a small brass plaque was placed on all of the historic artefacts at Warmer Castle. It's called the Heirlooms Act. If you ever walk around Warmer Castle, you'll see there's little brass plaques and numbers on lots of different furniture, oil paintings and things. Um, 
If he hadn't done this, um, there would be very little to see at Warmer Castle. Um, nowadays, when curators for an English heritage, um, they remodel the rooms to show a different period of Warmer Castle's 500-year history. Um, they use old paintings or very old photographs. And thankfully, because the, of the heirlooms act and this man's hard work, um, we know that all that furniture is still there. So even though this man died after six months and held the position of Lord Warden of the St. Ports for the shortest period of time, in many ways he uh, left the greatest legacy. Now, of course, I couldn't really talk about Lord Wardens of the St. Ports without talking about this lovely lady here, um, the Queen Mother. Um, she became Lord Warden in 1978. Um, she's the only ever female Lord Warden in the history of the position. Um, she held the position of Lord Warden until 2002, um, when sadly she passed away. Now, of course, I'm a bit too young to remember her tenure as Lord Warden of the St. Ports, but some of the staff that I've worked with in my time for English Heritage um, were there at Warmer Castle when she was Lord Warden of the St. Ports. Um, they often tell me that she would land in a helicopter in the paddock and she'd be picked up by a limousine. And as soon as the limousine entered the gates at Warmer Castle, um, somebody had to hoist the royal standard. And if you didn't get that up in time um, before she walked into the gatehouse, you missed the opportunity to meet her. Because I didn't know this until somebody explained this to me, but you can never enter a room that royalty are in. It can only ever be the other way round. So if you didn't get that flag up, you didn't get to meet her. She was always, always very interested in how um, English heritage were doing, what sort of guests we were having. Um, she absolutely loved the gardens at Warmer Castle. Um, she would immediately go out there with her dogs. Um, yeah. Now, even though... Um, Nowadays, the position of Lord Warden of the St. Ports is purely honorific. Um, in the olden days, it was a very, very important position. Um, your job as Lord Warden was to communicate between the St. Port towns and the Crown. Okay, nowadays, it's purely honorific. But the Lord Wardens of the St. Ports, um, they still meet up with all of the different mayors and dignitaries um, of all of the different St. Port towns. Now, when she passed away in 2002, the position um, was vacant for two years before a decision was made um, on who would take up the position. This is the current Lord Warden of the St. Ports, um, Admiral of the Fleet, the Lord Boyce. Um, he is the ex-chief of the defence staff. Um, absolutely lovely gentleman. Um, we're very, very lucky to have him as Lord Warden of the Sink Ports because of the Sink Ports connection to the Navy and ships, and ultimately he's an Admiral, a Navy man. Um, the first time I ever met um, Lord Boyce, um, I call him Lord Boyce, he calls me George. So <laughs> <it's quite laughs> um, he came in, I was working in a tent in the garden at Warmer Castle, and I'd only been working there a few weeks. Um, and he came in with his, um, his wife at the time and they started talking to me and I, I didn't that know at the time who he was because I was very, very busy and he was talking to me and I was, he was, as he was talking I was thinking, I know your face from somewhere. <laughs> I was going to say, are you on TV? Are you in a film? And then suddenly I realised who he was and yeah, for several years I was very, very nervous around him. Now that I've got to know him a bit more, I'm a little bit more relaxed but we are very, very lucky to have him. Now, on that note, I'm not really sure how long I've been talking for, um, but does anybody have any questions at all? <laughs>